Before we get into God's word this morning, as far as possible, let's kneel before our maker in prayer. We are grateful for air conditioning on a warm Sabbath, or what will be a warm Sabbath. We're grateful for being together in this place. You have blessed us in so many ways, dear God. Lord, we thank you for music and the way that it touches our hearts and gives us peace and tranquility in a world that is chaotic and filled with suffering and difficulty. Lord, we pray that we can be your hands and feet. We may not be able to solve all the world's problems, but there are people in our lives, in our circles that we associate with that can use the love and joy and peace and forgiveness and in all the things that you want to extend to them through us. So Lord, open our eyes to show us this week how we can make a difference for you. We pray for Camp Wawona. We know that they've been evacuated due to the fire that's nearby. Uh, and for those who've been able to be there, we know how special that place is, how beautiful it is. And Father, if it's your will, we pray that you'll preserve that special camp and, and all the homes and neighbors and, and people nearby. Uh, we want to get back there as soon as we can. And so we pray, Father, that um, the containment lines will be able to be held and that the winds will stay manageable and that soon this fire can be contained. We pray that you'll open our hearts uh, as we dig into your word this morning. Uh, we don't want to just read it for the sake of reading it. Uh, we don't want to know it for the sake of having more knowledge Father, really what we need and want is to have uh, an encounter with you and for you to change our hearts as we willingly surrender to whatever you say to us as individuals this morning. So that's our prayer, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you own a cat? Okay, what about dogs? Who owns a dog? Who owns a cat and a dog? At least, okay. I own neither, but as I said to someone this last week, I, I enjoy being like a grandparent where you get to go to the house of people who own cats and dogs, play with them, pet them, throw a ball for them, whatever, and then you leave. And then the people who own them get to take care of them. Well, I was thinking about cats. And cats have an amazing ability, as you know, if you own a cat or if you've seen this, cats have an amazing ability to almost always land on their feet, no matter how they fall. Have you seen that before? And there are some cool videos on YouTube with slow motion cameras, uh, or cameras that can capture things in slow motion. And you can see how the cat is able to use its tail and spinning its torso just right to be able to, to rotate and land on its feet. Some people seem to have that ability in life. When things are difficult, um, when they make mistakes, they still somehow manage to land on their feet and be okay. Well, our story from the book of Acts today talks about a, a husband and wife, a couple, that thought they could turn truth and justice and righteousness upside down and still land on their feet. But instead, they landed at the feet of Peter, both of them dead. Open up your Bibles with me to the book of Acts, 
Acts chapter 4, and we're going to take a look at what's perhaps the most unusual or disturbing story in the book of Acts. But we're going to see that there's some powerful lessons that we can learn from this husband and wife. Acts chapter 4, continuing our series through the book of Acts, and we start in, in verse 32. Luke, who is the author of Acts, he goes back and forth between narrating stories, and then sometimes he'll give an internal view of the church, kind of a a synopsis or a summary of what was going on inside, or sometimes he'll give an external view, how it looked from the outsider. But here in verse 32, he talks about the internal condition of the church. Acts 4, 32, now the multitude of those who believed were of one what? One heart and one what? One soul. So they were really divided, weren't they? No. Do you think they believed all the same about politics? Probably not. Remember Jesus' disciples. He had some people that were radically on one side uh, and some that were more in, in the middle. But yet, the miracle of the Holy Spirit was that God was able to take people who looked at the world differently, who grew up in different areas of Palestine who had different occupations, and the Bible says they were of one heart and one soul. If anything is a a testimony to the miracle of the resurrection, it's this. Because as you know, our nation is as divided as it's ever been. But they were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things in what? In common. So again, they were so radically committed and convinced that God owned everything. That what they owned, they really didn't own. They were just entrusted. They were just supervisors looking after it. And if God wanted it or asked for their possessions or their time or or their life, at any time, they would say, okay, God, it's yours anyways. I'm giving it back to you. They were committed to this. They had all things in common. And by the way, we're going to see this word common later on in Acts chapter 10 with the vision that Peter has. It's the Greek word koinos. And it's an interesting word because you find this same word, koinos, used in the end of Romans chapter 14 where where Paul's talking about uh, not judging one another and and then he gets into the food issue. and, And a lot of Bibles translate the word as unclean The word is actually koinos, which is relating to things that are common, uh, or sometimes the common things become defiled. Mark chapter 7, when Jesus was criticized by the Pharisees, because they said, hey, your disciples don't wash their hands ceremonially in the right way before they eat. Their hands are defiled. It's the word koinos. Their hands are are common. Um, So you didn't really need to know all that now, but when we get to Acts chapter 10... When Peter says, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean or common, uh, this word is very important. And by the way, when you look at the Old Testament, in the passages that deal with clean and unclean foods, koinos in the Greek Greek Old Testament is never used. It's a different word, um, which helps sort out some of these passages that sometimes we get confused by. But as far as their possessions went, they just viewed it as common. It was, was, everybody shared what they had. They were willing to share what they had. Verse 33, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to what? The resurrection, pointing people back to the reality. Jesus is alive, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of land or houses sold them. And they brought the proceeds of these things that were sold and laid them at the the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Pretty remarkable. Uh, It's a very different concept to think about when we compare the way they lived with the way we live. Would you agree? The way our society is. Our society is all about get, get, get. It's all about me building up my empire The disciples and the followers in those days, they realized the only thing we need to be building up is the kingdom of God. 
And so if there's something I can do or give or sell, or I'm going to do it because it's for the kingdom, because Jesus is alive and the world needs to know this. It's also interesting, as I was reading uh, in the Adventist Bible commentary this week, you remember various times when the people went into captivity, like the Babylonian captivity and so forth, what happened to the land that they possessed when they went captive? Were they still managing their farm from Babylon and seeing how the vineyards were doing? And No, they lost it all, didn't they? Um, and, in fact, there's a passage where Jeremiah, in, in talking about them being able to get it back eventually, he encourages them to go buy lands. But the point was brought up that Jesus had told his followers, the Romans are going to come and they're going to destroy the city. They're going to flatten it. They're going to level it. And it's possible that some of the believers, recognizing that it was all going to be useless for them anyways, said we might as well do something good with it. And by faith in Jesus' word, they sold their properties, not only to be a blessing to the, the, the believers, uh, but so that that property could have something done with it. Uh, you know, when the Lord returns, the things that we own, <laughs> it's all going up in flames anyways, isn't it? Like that joke where the guy, you know, tries to take, he goes to heaven early, uh, sneak preview, uh, and he has all the gold that he collected in his life. And he gets there, and, and St. Peter, in the joke, says, hey, what are you doing with all that pavement in your suitcase? Right? Uh, we can't take it with us. The only thing that we can take with us, two things. Your character and converts. People who you have helped bring to Jesus. So people were selling their properties because... Th they had a higher goal, kingdom building, not empire building. Verse 36, it says, And Joseph, whose name was also what? Barnabas. Now Luke has an interesting habit. He um, introduces briefly some of the characters that are going to be featured more extensively later on. And so here is Barnabas's little mini introduction, and we're going to learn more about him later on. Think about the Apostle Paul. Just a brief mention. Oh yeah, they threw the cloaks at this guy's feet named Saul. And then Luke's going to come back and tell us a lot more about Saul slash Paul. But there's this guy named Barnabas. By the Apostles, uh, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it where? At the Apostles' feet. Now, an, an interesting ancient church tradition written by Clement of Alexandria says that Barnabas was actually one of the 70 who Jesus sent out uh, on that missionary adventure. We don't know if it's true, but Clement lived a whole lot closer to the events than we did. So it's interesting to think about. So Barnabas did this, and, and this was an example of a, a good thing to do. And then we get into chapter 5. It says, but a certain man named what? Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds. That Greek word there for kept back is used in Titus 2.10. It's translated as pilfer or steal. Uh, in fact, if you look at the Greek Old Testament, it's used in Joshua 7 in the story of Achan. Remember, Achan took something that wasn't his, hid it underneath his tent, and it was a disaster for he and his family. So Ananias and Sapphira, they decide we want to give something to the church. Um, but they keep back part of it. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. His wife was also aware of it, and they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said... Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to whom? To the Holy Spirit. And keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, wasn't it your own? And after it sold, wasn't it in your control? The implied answer is yes, yes it was. 
Why then have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So what's going on here? A couple of things are going on. Number one, Peter apparently is, is given knowledge by the Holy Spirit that the amount that was laid at his feet was not the right amount. And of course, Ananias and Sapphira, they were not obligated to give anything to the church, but apparently they were doing it to make everybody believe they were giving the whole enchilada when they were keeping a portion back for themselves. It wasn't a, maybe a verbal lie, but it, this was an acted out lie. Greed was, was taking over their hearts. Love of display and, and hypocrisy. Here I am, I'm so generous, I'm giving it all. Thinking about the portion that they had at home. Now, we don't have all the details, which, which makes this story a little bit more tricky, but it's not hard to imagine the circumstances that led up to their choice. Now notice here uh, an important point that we don't want to skip over. In, in verse 3, who did they lie to in verse 3? The Holy Spirit. Now, can you lie to electricity? If I go over to like the, the outlets at the wall and say, my name is not John, it's Jacob. <laughs> it wouldn't make a lot of sense. Would the electricity know or understand or can I lie to it? Of course not. You can't lie to something that is impersonal and not capable, uh, not sentient, right? Uh, especially something that doesn't understand. The point I'm making is the Holy Spirit is a personal being, a being that can be lied to. And not only that, the Holy Spirit is divine. Verse 3 says you lied to the Holy Spirit. Verse 4 says you lied not to men, but to whom? To God. It's important for us to, to keep our eyes open to these details. So upon hearing these things, verse 5, Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, probably put him in a shroud, a burial shroud, carried him out and buried him. In Jerusalem in those days, yeah, it was only the kings and the prophets who were buried inside the city. So they took him outside the city. And in those days, they laid him probably in a, in a cave or some sort of tomb. They'd let the body decompose, and eventually they'd put all the, the remnant and the bones and stuff into a box, a burial box. Archaeologists have found the burial box for the family of Caiaphas, uh, which is very interesting. One of the biblical characters and his family's bone box, ossuary, has been located. So this didn't take very long. Verse 7, it says, now it was about how many hours later? Three hours later. This was a quick service. Three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered and said, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Now, we don't know if Peter was asking, did you sell it for the lower amount, or did you sell it for the higher amount? But you'll notice that she had an opportunity in her answer to admit, didn't she? She had an opportunity to confess, uh, and presumably Ananias did as well. But she, whatever her answer was, she went along with the lie, continued the deception, Verse 9, then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together? So this was premeditated deception. It wasn't just on the fly. They had plotted and planned this. How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately, what happened? She fell at his feet. This is the spot where the money had been laid at Peter's feet, and now she falls down at his feet. Now, notice also carefully, Peter, did he pronounce a curse on her? 
Did he say, in the name of God, die? No, he didn't. Um, now, we don't know the exact cause of her death, but clearly, um, you know, some have wondered, did they both have heart attacks at the same, you know, in, in that right moment? Um, probably not. Uh, we don't know all the details, like we say, but Peter knew before it happened that it was going to happen. The hand of God was working here in an unusual way to bring about an early judgment, as it were, upon them. Immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her out, buried her by her husband. Now what was the result of all of these things? Our last verse here before we think about what we've been reading. It says in verse 11, so great what? Fear. And this word fear has a bigger meaning than just, oh no, I'm scared. What else does fear mean in the New Testament? Awe, respect, reverence. Uh, exactly. A great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And this is actually the first uh, mention in Greek of that word ekklesia, the church, in the book of Acts. The first time it's mentioned and it was in response to the things that had happened with Ananias and Sapphira. They were being filled with this fear and reverence. So, reading a story like this, what do we do with it? It's not probably one that we have in our little books that we'll be reading to Emmeline as she goes to bed at night, right? We don't tend to tell this story for children's story. So be honest, boys and girls, or you're going to fall down dead. <laughs> don't tend to do that. And there's good reasons for that. And this was a very, very unusual circumstance, wasn't it? When you look through the Bible, it's very, very rare for God to bring about sudden and decisive judgment like this. A lot of the times when he punishes, it's simply by removing his protection and allowing the natural consequences which are bad enough in that moment, aren't they? Romans chapter 1 talks about these people who are ignoring God, even though they know God's there. And so multiple times it says he just uh, turns them over to their sinful desires. And for the present life and the present time, that's good enough. It's very, very rare to have something like this. Uh, but, w but when there are moments like this, it's because it's very important um, that God needed to intervene in this way. You think about who Ananias and Sapphira were. We don't know much or anything more beyond them from what the story tells us. But they were both members of the infant Christian church. This wasn't too long after the day of Pentecost. This wasn't long after the resurrection of Jesus. They were part of the church, presumably because they had come to believe. Uh, maybe they had been given some of the gifts and blessings of the Holy Spirit, even. Um, we don't know whether they were there on the day of Pentecost or not, but they had, to some degree, been a part of this whole community. But then, instead of surrendering day by day to the Holy Spirit, they found themselves surrendering to a different spirit. What spirit was that? There's the spirits of greed, hypocrisy, spirits of deception. Very, very dangerous spirits to surrender to. And in early days of the Christian church, it was very important that the gospel get a chance to thrive and grow and go to the whole world. And if the church at that early phase started to become filled with greed, deception, hypocrisy, and these sorts of things, it could have had devastating consequences. And we know, you know, it wasn't too much long after that. The Apostle Paul and others predicted bad, bad people are going to come in and do these things. But in this very kernel of the beginning of the church, it was essential that it Stay pure. Notice the words here. I'll put a verse on the screen. Words of Ecclesiastes, chapter 8, 
and verse 11. It says, when evil people are not punished right away, what happens? It makes others want to do evil too. Sometimes that's the reality. When people, uh, like, like a cat, can fall upside down and then land on their feet, it makes other people think, well, maybe I can get away with that too. You didn't report everything on your taxes? Well, maybe I can slip the wool or put the wool over Uncle Sam's eyes also. One bad influence leads to another. And in those early days, it was essential that the church start strong. I was reading in the book Acts of the Apostles. Now, I'm going to put a quote here on the screen for you. Pretty powerful statement. It says, Infinite wisdom saw that this signal manifestation of the wrath of God was necessary to what? Guard the young church from becoming demoralized. In other words, for their, their morals going down, uh, not just becoming uh, sad like we sometimes use it today. The numbers were rapidly increasing. The church would have been endangered if, in the rapid increase of converts, men and women had been added who, while professing to serve God, were worshiping what? Mammon, or wealth, earthly riches. This judgment testified that men cannot deceive God, that he detects the hidden sin of the heart, and that he will not be mocked. It was designed as a warning to the church to lead them to avoid pretense and hypocrisy, and to be aware, beware of robbing God. Pretty powerful thoughts to consider here this morning. God did it, not because he didn't love the church, not because he didn't love Ananias and Sapphira, but exactly because he loved them. And he wanted this message that we have received to go out and spread. And look again at verse 11, Acts chapter 5, verse 11. What was the result, the net result? It says, great fear came upon the church. It gave them a renewed sense of holiness and purpose and the, the great sovereignty of God and the importance of treating God and Jesus and, and living life um, as it's meant to be lived. So what can we learn from the story? How can we wrap it up, tie it, put a bow on it, and... Uh, and go back out in the world to live another week? What can we take away? Well, I think there are three big things that we need to be careful of and we need to root out in our lives with the Holy Spirit's help. Three big dangers. Number one, the danger of dishonesty. Every lie that we tell has a consequence, has a victim. And often the victim is ourself. Ananias and Sapphira not only lied to the Holy Spirit, not only lied to the believers through their actions, they were lying to themselves. They were deceiving themselves, thinking, it's okay to compromise with sin. I can land on my feet. I'm going to be all right. That's a lie that we tell ourselves. It's all, I know I really shouldn't be, but it'll be okay. I'll be okay. That's a lie that, that, that Satan is telling us. It's not going to be okay, even if the end of the story is okay. There are always consequences. Uh, notice this uh, powerful quote here from Acts of the Apostles. He who utters untruths does what? Sells his soul in a cheap market. If you're lying through your actions or through your words, my words, we're selling ourselves cheap. Let us be people of the truth. Amen? Sometimes the truth is hard. Sometimes it's hard to admit the truth about ourselves. If Ananias and Sapphira had simply said, hey, Peter, uh, we sold this land. We're going to be keeping, you know, 40%, but here's 60%. Everything would have been okay. But they were trying to look sacrificial without so much sacrifice. They were trying to look holy without truly being holy. They wanted to look sanctified without really the sanctification that goes along with it. 
First big danger, dishonesty. No such thing as a white lie. Number two, second big danger is greed. What, what motivated them to be dishonest was their greed, their love of money and their love of hanging on to stuff. When we know in the big picture, I was talking with Richard this morning, the big picture, this great controversy that is surrounding us, this battle between good and evil, when we know in the big picture that Jesus is coming back and all the worldly possessions we have are going to go poof, that might help make us less greedy. When we recognize that everything that God has given us is really just on loan, it might help us out. You know, it's interesting that Luke writes about this because Luke wrote Acts. He's a doctor, and so he probably was more well-to-do than the rest of the believers. He knew about some of these temptations. And when you read his Gospels, he wrote about certain people that had struggles with wealth, with money. He wrote about uh, Judas selling Jesus out for money. He wrote about the rich young man that almost... Gave it all up, but just loved his wealth too much. Luke also wrote about the the rich young fool. In his stories, he's cautioning us, he's warning us to not let the wealth of the world deceive us. And maybe it's not money, but maybe it's the entertainment of this world. Maybe it's the pleasures of this world that have got a hold of our heart. We need to, to not only be honest with ourselves, we need to be honest with God about the things uh, that tend to, ca- the, the cause our eyes to turn to the side. We need to be careful of dishonesty, of greed, and finally, of hypocrisy or desire for self-exaltation. That was the first big sin, wasn't it? Lucifer wanted to be higher. He wanted more power, more, more glory and authority. Ananias and Sapphira wanted to appear like they had it all together. And I tell you what, this is one of the most cunning and deceptive ones of all of these things. Because how many of us, no matter what we're feeling, put on a happy Sabbath smile and we come to church, hey, hey, brother, good to see you. When inside, maybe we're really struggling. And I know it's okay, you know... (laughs) We don't have to go up to everybody and explain all the difficulties that we're dealing with and all the temptations that we're fighting. God's not asking for that. But part of honesty is being honest with close friends, trusted people. Um, And if we can't find trusted people here at church, boy, uh, that says something about our church. We need to be a church where people are safe expressing the struggles and disappointments and difficulties that they're dealing with. Amen? We need to be a church that's not worried about when you share something in confidence with someone else, you're not worried that it's going to get out to anybody else. Amen? We want to be a non-gossiping church. Amen? These are the kinds of things that help grow us. The kinds of things that we need because this, this uh, hypocrisy thing, I mean, if we're honest, we all struggle with it. We don't feel like admitting every day how, how broken we are. Uh, and like I said, there are places where certain levels of disclosure are more appropriate than others. Uh, but even in when, we, when, we ask, when people ask you, how are you doing? If you're not doing good, you don't have to say, I'm great. I'm good. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with the other people. You don't have to say this is like a horrible, horrible day. You could say, well, uh, I need the Lord's help today. Going through some stuff, don't want to get into it, but pray for me. Um, How many times, you know, we just reflexively want to appear like we're doing good when we aren't doing good. Let this be a place where we are safe sharing how we're really doing. Amen? Um, Who of you have it all together? Who of you have no struggles and no temptations that you deal with? Okay, I didn't, for the record, 
Those of you watching at home, I didn't see any hands go up. You have all just admitted your life isn't perfect. You have struggles. You have temptations. Which means we're all in this thing together. Which means that you can ask each other for prayers. You can ask one another. What are the three big dangers we saw this morning? Number one, dishonesty with others, with ourselves, with God, greed, and then trying to make others think we're better than we are. While the story didn't end happy for Ananias and Sapphira, uh, the story ended better for the church, which took heed to the things that were going on. Next week, or next time we we pick it up, I'll be at camp meeting next week, Uh, next time we pick up the story, we're going to see how God continued to prosper and grow the church. But let me just ask you, as we close out this morning, do you want God to keep working on in in your life in any of these areas? Maybe as we pray today, if you just want to admit, I am a sinner, I need God's help, I don't have it all together, If you want to admit that, then why don't you just stand as we have our closing prayer? And if you're not able to stand, that's okay too. But if if you know today you need God's help and you don't have it all figured out, join me, I'm standing, and let's ask God to help us broken, messed up sinners that are perfect in his eyes under his blood to grow and be more like Loving Heavenly Father, we recognize that when you look at our hearts, you see a lot of areas that you want us to grow. We're so thankful that we're not saved by our works, Lord, uh, but we know we can be so much better for you, for our families, for our witness. There are so many areas of, of our character that you want to mold and improve. And so today, Lord, in our hearts, we say yes. Please help me. Help us, God. We're struggling. Help us, God. We have, we have all sorts of temptations and trials we're dealing with. But today, we are thankful, Jesus, that you are alive. And because you live, we know that that resurrection power is available to us to help mold us and forgive us and grow us and empower us to be bolder witnesses for you this week. So, Lord, uh, help us to be honest. Take away our love for our possessions. uh, And may we be genuine, authentic, loving, and lovable Christians this week. This is our prayer. Let everybody say, amen and amen. You may be seated. God bless you, and have a happy, wonderful Sabbath.